Shall we rise up to pray? You want to commit yourself to the Lord today before the Bible study. That the Lord himself will speak to you as he gets us through verse after verse and passage after passage. That the Lord himself will speak to your heart. Open your heart and open your mouth before the Lord and speak and say, Lord, teach me tonight. Reveal your mind, your will unto me. Keep me awake and at alert that your word today will be of tremendous benefit to my life, to my family, and to the church. Give me insight in your word, understanding in your word, that the truth, revealed truth, will be a great, great benefit to my soul. Pray that you will not be like the children of Israel that read and learned, studied the word every week, every Sabbath day. And yet the word did not profit them. Because they did not mix a faith in their hearts. Pray that the Lord will mix a faith in our hearts. There will be a willingness, a yieldedness, a surrenderedness to the Lord. That the Spirit of God himself will make a personal application of the word to your heart, to my heart, to your life, to my life, to your family, to my family. So that as believers, we get stronger and stronger. In the word. And the strength, the might, the power of the word and of the spirit will so touch us turn us around transform our lives that the people who see us anywhere and everywhere they will know we have been at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ drinking in his word Pray that you will not be forgetful learners, forgetful hearers of the word, but that we will be doers of the word. And the blessing of obedience will be upon our lives. Pray that Christ will be your Lord as he is your Savior. The Lord of your life. The controller. The director of every part of your life. Every little bit, every great part of your life. That the Lord will help you to make a personal application of what we read, what we learn, your life. That Christ, the Lord and King, Savior, Redeemer, Director, Leader, Controller, of every part of your life, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I 
and pray that your life will lead others to him. That you are enlightened in the word. Your light will so shine before men. And they will see your righteous life, your good works. And the glorify our Father who is in heaven because of you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And then after that, all these things that you desire will be added unto you. Put first things first. Set your priorities right. Make him king of your life. The lord of your life. The lord of the whole family. That every step you take. Every word you speak, every decision you make, every habit you form will be under the control of a master and king, Lord Jesus. Let him have the glory in your life at all times, in all things. Reign, Master Jesus. Reign, King Jesus, over my life, over my will. Over my tongue, over my character, over every part of my life, be the Lord and be the King. Let him be king and lord. Let his will subdue your will. And say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We bless your name. Because you've gathered us together so you can reveal your mind unto us. Lord, we pray tonight your will, your mind, your word will be made clear to everyone in Jesus' name. 
We know you love us, that's why you're revealing these things to us, and you say, Blessed our ears for what we hear, blessed our eyes are because of what we see. Oh Lord, we pray the blessedness will go beyond just seeing and hearing, and the blessedness will come into practicing and performing everything we learn in your word in Jesus' name. That Lord within and around, you'll change us through and through by your word in Jesus' name. There are many people outside there who do not know you. But we thank you, Lord, because you have called us yourself so we can know you. There are many people out there who do not obey you. But, Lord, we thank you for the grace you have given us to be obedient unto your word. We pray, Lord, this life of holiness, righteousness, and obedience will continue ever in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And when you come again the second time, we will be the people you'll take with us along with all your people all over the earth in Jesus' name. And then will you reign and we will reign with you ever and ever in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that tonight you open the pages of the scriptures unto us and we pray that what we learn will be of great, great, tremendous benefit to every one of us. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can see now. We come back to our study of Daniel. We're in Daniel chapter 2. As you know, Nebuchadnezzar is the major figure or character in chapter 2. And his dream was actually what brought a great problem upon the wise men of Babylon until Daniel came out and then God gave him the insight and the revelation, inspiration to be able to discover the dream and then in Interpret the dream. In the latter part of the interpretation of the dream, we're looking at tonight. But we need to make a connection. You need to know what is before so that you'll be able to know the relevance of what we're studying tonight. I'm reading to you from Daniel chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 27. Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded dead. Cannot the wise men, the astrologers, and the magicians, and the soothsayers, and the show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven. Praise the Lord. There is a God in heaven. Whenever there's any doubt or result, any problem, any mountain, any difficulty, anything that is sitting away from you, and you're searching, what is the meaning of this? How can I tell about this? Remember, there is a God in heaven. And whenever there are people around you, and they just say, well, sorry, you cannot have any solution for your problem. Remember, there is a God in heaven where your life is at stake. And it appears that the problem is going to swallow you up And might even kill you and destroy you And people say there is no solution The wise men of the land The magicians of the land The scientists of the land They do not have any solution to the problem you have This is what you need to always remember There is a God in heaven It may be a problem for a king It may be a problem for the father of the house It may be a problem in the whole family it may be a problem with your children It may be a problem in the church And it appears that the church is surrendering To faith And then we'll say what can we do There is no solution to this We'll leave with the problem No, remember there is a God in heaven That solves problems And it will solve your problem there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And then it says, And maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days the dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And then with that, he began to tell Nebuchadnezzar about the dream. What's the gist of the dream? The summary of the dream. We're looking at it from the start here one. Thou, O king, sawest. And behold, the great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Now Daniel began to tell the king, he said, this is what you had, and it appeared the brilliance of the image. 
of the golden head and the silver chest and the top and the and the ties of brass and the legs of iron and clay as he looked at it what a magnificent awesome image that was but then it said it was eventually as then looked at it intimately it was terrible in verse 32 these images edge was of fine gold his breast and arms of silver, his belly and his tides of brass, his leg of iron and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest that his stone was cut out without hand, which smote the image upon his feet, and that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, broken into pieces together. And became like chaff of the summer uh, threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's the dream. And that's what brought perplexity and trouble and trauma into the heart, into the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's dream interpreted by Daniel foreshadows the history of successive gentile kings and kingdoms and their final overthrow by Christ's supreme supernatural power. From the whole interpretation, we learn that the history of the world is not determined by the will of kings and emperors, by the progress and destiny of the nations. Those, the progress and the destiny of the, of the world are determined beforehand according to God's plan and God's purpose. The Assyrians didn't know that. The Egyptians didn't know that. The Babylonians didn't know that. The Persians didn't know that. They thought it was by their army. By their power, by their strength, by their military genius. That's how they overcame. But everything had been outlined in the mind of God. And now he revealed it to Daniel and said, This is the interpretation of the dream, the character of these successive kings. And the part they take in general order of events is expressed by the position and the value of the different minerals in the image. The image reveals that there is a certain continuity in the history of the successive monarchies and kingdoms. Because, you see, it was a kind of solid image. Although you have gold, and you have silver, you have brass, you have iron, you have clay, yet there wasn't any space. It was all together. And yet, because the minerals were different, it tells us they didn't have really harmonic unity, harmony and organic unity. The reign of each king was degraded by undue reliance on material force and brute power. They didn't rely on God. Even though God was controlling everything, they relied on brute power. Beastly power, it is brutal power. And then they relied on just physical force. The brightness of the image was excellent, but the form thereof was terrible. We've read that already in verse 31. Behind the glitter and the splendor of the Gentile kingdoms is their brutal cruelty, their injustice, and their selfish tyranny. The whole image is destroyed by supernatural stone. There is nothing stable in unjust power. The old order changes, yielding place to the new. Now, the supernatural stone that struck the image, shattered the image, smashed the image, scattered it into pieces. That's the image, that's the stone we're looking at today. And this stone in its original was without, was cut out without hands. In its action, it smote the image. I'm reading it to you again in verse 35. Verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. 
Now you understand the stone. All commentators, all interpreters of the Bible, everyone I've read, many of them, they all know that the stone is Christ. It's very clear in scripture. As you look at verse after verse in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, you will see that the stone is Christ. But when many of the interpreters make a mistake, is that they say that Christ came. And he came in, uh, he came in Bethlehem. He came and then walked in Nazareth and then in Galilee and then in Jerusalem. Healed many people and he said that was the action of the stone. That's not correct. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. Because you see, when Jesus Christ came the first time, he came to save. This time, he's not coming to save, he's coming to smite. When he came the first time, he came to develop, to raise up the church, to build the church. But this time when he's coming, he's not coming to develop, he's coming to destroy. The stone that is cut out of the mountain without hand, struck at the image, and shattered and scattered and smashed, and then everything went into pieces. When he came the first time, he came to cleanse. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When it comes the second time, it's not coming to cleanse, it's coming to crush. That's what the stone did. The stone did not cleanse the image, it crushed the image. You know, when he came, he came to show light, he said, I am the light of the world. When he came the first time, he came to enlighten us, to show us the way, and to show us the path of righteousness, to interpret unto us the word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. When he comes again, it's it's not coming to enlighten us. It's coming to eliminate the image. The stone will strike at that image. Everything will crumble and be crushed into pieces and then will be carried away by the wind. When he came the first time, he came to purify. Because the blood of Jesus Christ purifies. But you see, when he comes the second time, it's not coming to purify. It's coming to punish. He came to justify the first time. When he comes the second time, he's coming to judge. He came to redeem when he came the first time. In fact, many of the people, they wanted to make him a king. They said, the king is here now the first time. He said, no, I'm not coming to reign. I'm coming to redeem now. It is when he comes the second time that he's coming to reign. And then the word of God says that when that stone smote, that image, it became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And the interpretation you'll find in verse 44, and in the days of, the, of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to all the people, and it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The word of God says that kingdom shall stand forever. And you'll be there in Jesus' name. In verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that stone, that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass. Hereafter, the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. That tells us then the supernatural stone represents Christ. In his second coming, not his first coming. In his first coming, he came to save, to justify, to cleanse, to purify, to redeem, to deliver, and to transform. In his second coming, he will come to smite, to judge, to conquer, to punish, to reign, to destroy, to thresh the wine press of God's wrath. The kingdom of Christ is everlasting in duration. He is the eternal, unchanging, changeless, immutable king. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the description of Christ, the supernatural king. The description of Christ. The supernatural king. Number two, the day of Christ, the smiting king. The day of Christ, the smiting king. Number three, the dominion of Christ's sovereign kingdom. 
the dominion of Christ's sovereign kingdom. We come to number one, the description of Christ, the supernatural king. We're looking at it again in chapter 2 of Daniel, verse 34, verse 35. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. Please notice that a stone cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. And in verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So stand to what we need to understand that this stone has some qualities. Number one, it's a supernatural stone. Number two, it's a stumbling stone. Number three, it's a sconch stone. Number four, it's a special stone. Number five, it's a smiting stone. Number six, it's a shattering, smashing stone. Number seven, it's a sobering stone. I want you to look at the word of God. Number one, it's the, it's a supernatural stone. Have you seen it where, where, where I read to you in verse 34? Thou sawest till that his stone was cut out without hands without hands that means without human agency have you thought about the life of christ the conception of christ was without human agency the birth of Christ without human agency. The sinless life of Christ was without human agency. Then he died and the resurrection of Christ was without human agency. Then the ascension when he went to heaven, it wasn't any chariot or aeroplane that took him to heaven. He just went to heaven all by himself. Have you ever discovered that? That is without human agency. And then he's coming again in the air will be without human agency that shows us then the stone that was cut out of the mountain without any hand without any visible help of any man this is the Christ is from the very, very first book of the Bible we're told that this stone is coming and it's God himself we're looking at uh, Genesis chapter 49 Genesis chapter 49, verse 24, to show you that the stone is not just an ordinary stone, it is a supernatural stone. Chapter 49 of Genesis, verse 24, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his sons were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. That is a supernatural stone right there. But you understand number two, Jesus Christ is also the stumbling stone. You know, the Jews stumbled about him. They didn't understand him. Therefore, they stumbled at that stone. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 14, all through to verse 18. And he shall be be a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling. There you are. That's referring to Christ, a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to boast the houses of Israel, for a gene and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. We're talking about Christ. I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel, for from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. As you look at that, I am the children whom the Lord has given me. That verse is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2 concerning Christ 
and his followers. And so we know the stone of stumbling, the stumbling stone, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll see number one, they stumbled at his person. When he said, I am the son of God. Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. They stumbled at that. They didn't understand. Number two, they stumbled at his identity. He said, you will see the son of man coming in the clouds. Are you then the son of man? They stumbled at that. Number three, they stumbled at his doctrine. Because the doctrine of Jesus Christ did not follow after the tradition of those elders in Israel. Number four, for they stumbled at his authority. Who gave you this authority? From where have you found this authority? Number five, they stumbled at his claims. At his claims. What he claimed to be his person, his authority, his origin, his background, his everlasting nature. They stumbled at his claims. Number six, they stumbled at his miracles. Do you remember they said, I hey, don't mind him. That's what they said. We know that he is a sinner. But how did he open my eyes who have never heard that since the world began anybody opened the eyes of the blind. They stumbled at his miracles. Number seven, they stumbled at his practices. He went through the field and then his disciples took those ears of corn and they ate and he said why is it your disciples are doing that which is unlawful on the sabbath day they stumbled at him you know what jesus was number one the supernatural stone number two the stumbling stone now number three he was the scorned stone the scorned stone you know they scorned him they despised him they rejected him we're looking at psalm 118 Psalm 118, he was conned, he was despised, he was rejected. In Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And you know that that is applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself applied that to himself. Look at Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 6. And Jesus Christ, he showed that he was a stone. He said, when you read Daniel... And you see that stone smashing and smiting and shattering that image. You know that that is referring to the very Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. See what he said himself. Mark chapter 12, verse 6. Having yet therefore one Son is well beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence, they will honor, they will respect my Son. But those of and men said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the, of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the Osman men and will give the vineyard unto others. Have ye not read the scripture, the stone, which the builders rejected, is become the hedge of the corner? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Can you see Jesus Christ applied that to himself? He said, I'm the one that is referring to, I am the son, the well-beloved of the father. I have come to you, and then you have rejected what I'm saying. It shows that I'm the stone stone. Number four, it was a special stone. Number one, supernatural. Number two is the, is the one that uh, we know as, uh, the, as the stumbling stone. Then number three is a stone stone. Then number four now is a special stone. We're looking at Isaiah again, chapter 28, a special cornerstone. Isaiah chapter 28, we're looking at verse 16. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion, for a foundation is stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make his. In verse 17, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plumage, and the hill shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. You see that Jesus Christ here is referred to by Isaiah as that precious stone, precious cornerstone, a tried stone, the foundation of the building of the temple of God. See that applied to Jesus Christ in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we're looking at verse 10. In Acts chapter 4 verse 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the hedge of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so we know that Jesus Christ is that unique personality, special one, the special stone. The special cornerstone. And it is on him we rely if we're going to have salvation. If we're going to build anything lasting, anything enduring, any life, any ministry, any church, any kingdom, not built on this cornerstone will eventually be destroyed. Number five, he is the smiting stone. The smiting stone. That is the stone that grinds the kingdoms of this world into powder. And then the wind will come and blow everything away. You'll not see a trace of it anymore. We're looking at Matthew chapter 21, the smiting stone. Matthew chapter 21, we're looking at verse 42. 21, 42. Jesus says unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the hedge of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits thereof. Verse 44, whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. That is, if you come to the stone by yourself, and you fall on your face before the stone, before the Lord Jesus Christ, and you, and you crumble in the ground by yourself, and you are broken, your heart is broken, break up your fallow ground, and in repentance to turn to the Lord, then you have mercy. But if you wait long, long, long time until the stone will fall upon you and then it will grind you to powder. And that's what we're told in Daniel chapter 2 that that stone came. It was taken out of the mountain without hand. And then it smashed the image. And then it ground it to a powder or to, or to chaff. And then the wind blew it away. Number six is the shattering stone. This is the stone that shatters, that scatters, that smashes. The stone that totally breaks up everything. We're looking at Luke chapter 20 verse 17. Luke chapter 20. And we're reading it from verse 17 and verse 18. Luke chapter 20. Reading from verse 17. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the hedge of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. And let's look at some two. In some two, we're reading from verse six. Why don't we go back to verse one? Some two, reading from verse one. Why do the heathen rage? 
And the people imagined a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cuts from us. He that seated in the heavens shall do what? Shall laugh. And that was what God did when Pharaoh said, Who is that God? He that sitteth in the heavens shall love. And then when that, a Goliath came out and he said, Give me a man. If I defeat him, then I conquer the whole of the nation of Israel. Goliath, you don't know what you are talking about. That is the very nation where God puts his name. You cannot conquer them because you cannot conquer God. Had God latch at him. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, If I want to throw you into the fire, who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? He that seated in the heaven shall laugh. And Herod said, You go and find out where that Christ will be born. And then I will come and worship him. He actually wanted to go and kill him. He that seated in the heaven shall laugh. And then the church began. And then you see Herod, Herod was, uh, was Saul, they were breathing threatenings upon the church, wanting to destroy the church, saying, this will not be, we're going to destroy the whole church, and that Christ will not come and reign. He that seated in the heavens shall love. In our own lifetime, there have been people that rose up and they said, no, it will not be. If you have heard the name of Hitler, he wanted to destroy all the Jews. He that seated in the heaven shall love. There was a man called Voltaire. And Voltaire was a man, he was an atheist, and he said, Bible, hmm, nothing about the Bible. In 100 years, the Bible will be forgotten. Christianity will be forgotten. He that seated in the heaven shall love. And, uh, you, you know, Voltaire died, but the church is still alive. I said the church is still alive. Not only that, 50 years ties death, the Bible Society bought his house over and then bought his printing press over and in that house in that with his printing press they began to roll out millions of Bibles to cover the whole earth. The man that said Christianity will not remain, Christianity is still here. And then his house was turned to the printing press that you know was taking Bible all over the world. Here we are told he that seated in the heaven shall love the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Verse 6 Yea, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Fellowship with the Son. Surrender, submit to the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled, but for a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Have you put your trust in Christ? Then you are blessed. Number seven is the sovereign stone. That is the stone that will reign forever and ever. That you'll find in Daniel. We've read it before. We're going to read it again. This is beautiful to read. In Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. We're looking at verse 35. In verse 35 it says, Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broke into pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. 
and fills the earth. The interpretation we're looking at verse 44 in the days of this king shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to all the people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Christ's kingdom shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God of heaven has made known to the king, what shall come to pass hereafter? The dream is certain. And the interpreter thereof is what? It is sure. We come to point number two. In point number two now, we're coming to the day of Christ, the smiting king. There is a day when this will happen. Actually, when uh, this man, Nebuchadnezzar, before he slept that night and before he had a dream, he was, he was thinking, what shall be on the future, in a future date? Let's look at Daniel chapter two, verse 29. Daniel chapter 2 verse 29 As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed What shall come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee What shall come to pass? And Daniel said, you are thinking of what will happen later At a later time hereafter And the God of heaven who makes known what is secret He has revealed this unto you. Look at verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, that maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. There is a day coming when this shall be fulfilled. That's why we're talking about the day of Christ, the smiting king. We're looking at a second Thessalonians chapter two, a day that is coming, that day coming very swiftly and will soon be here when Christ himself shall smite all the kingdoms of the world and then he will establish an everlasting kingdom. In second Thessalonians chapter two, I'm reading from Verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that she be not so shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by the Spirit, for, nor by word, nor by letter, as, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ. You see that, you see that phrase there? And see what the apostle is talking about. He said, there is a day coming, and that is the day of Christ. In verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day. It's referring to a particular time, a particular period, a particular day, still in the future. For that day shall not come except there be a falling away. There come a falling away force. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, seateth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what with wholeness that she may be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then on that day, that day of Christ, then shall that wicked be revealed. And whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 5, the day, the day of Christ. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That's another reference to the day. 
the time, the period when the Lord will come. It's referring to when he will come again. You see the way Paul the apostle was talking to the Thessalonian believers, it's like it's still future. And yet we know Christ had come. He had come to die on the cross of Calvary. He had come to save. He had come to cleanse. He had come to redeem people unto himself. But there's still another coming that is being referred to here. And it says in verse 3. It says in verse 3. For when we, they shall say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them. As travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. It's telling us that day is coming. But because you are a child of God, because you belong to the Lord, it says you are not in darkness. You are not in the darkness of sin, in the darkness of idolatry, in the darkness of evil, in the darkness of the unsaved, in the darkness of the world. You have been brought to the light of the gospel and you have the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, that day that is coming will not come upon you as a thief in the night. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 10. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 10 there's a day coming and that day will be terrible for the people of the world it's still talking about the day of the lord second peter chapter 3 verse 10 but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the element shall melt with fervent heat they ask also and the works that are therein shall be born do you see there again in verse 10 the day of the lord is called the day of christ the day of his appearing the day of the lord and it's saying that will come as a thief in the night in verse 11 seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of what again of the day, the day of God. It's very clear when you look at the word of God that this day is coming. And we who are children of God were rejoicing because the coming of the Lord is imminent. And when he comes, he will first of all take away the people of God in the rapture. Then after the rapture, as we are away with the Lord, there will be seven years of the great tribulation here in the world. And then at the end of those seven years of great tribulation, the Lord will come to reign, and we shall reign with him in Jesus' name. It says in verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise look for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness wherefore beloved seeing that she look for such things be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless as we read in the New Testament about that day, so we read in the Old Testament too, that that day is what was known. So even the Old Testament prophets were looking at Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, we're reading from verse 6. How are ye for the day of the Lord is at hand? You know, if you're a student of the Bible, you'll find out that uh, the day of the Lord was not something hidden to the people of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Here we're told in Isaiah chapter 13 verse 6, How cry, wail, bewail yourself. For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. They shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof, 
out of it. So you know it's a day of judgment. That day that is coming. Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. Malachi chapter 4. We're looking at verse 5 as well as verse 6. Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Every time you hear about this day of the Lord, it is referring to the day of judgment. The day when the stone will smite that image, will crush that image, will scatter that image. Everything will be turned into chaff and powder and the wind of judgment will carry everything away. It's the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now you, you see what uh, we're learning but today now, today is the period of the times of the Gentiles. And do you know there's a period referred to as the times of the Gentiles? Look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 24. Luke chapter 21 verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles, that will come to an end during the, at the day of Christ. The Gentiles were bad enough. Don't you remember? The head of gold, the kingdom of Babylon, that's the times of the Gentiles. And then the chest and the arms of silver, the Middle Persian Empire, those are Gentiles. And then the ties and the belly of brass, which is referring to the Grecian Empire, that's also the Gentiles. And then the legs of iron and clay, the Roman Empire, all that is for the Gentiles. And and all that period of the times of the Gentiles, it will come to an end in the day of Christ. Then the times of the Gentiles will have been fulfilled and it will be all over for the Gentile people. But right now, at this time, the price that Jesus paid on the cross of Calvary for our salvation and redemption, that price is still available for you and for me. And we can plunge ourselves into the blood of the Lamb and be forgiven and be cleansed. Jesus Christ has paid the whole price for salvation and for our redemption. He bore indescribable pain and the full penalty of our sin to escape the coming judgment, coming on the final day, that final day of the Lord, and the judgment that is coming and the smiting of the earth. All we have to do today is to repent of our sins and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as a substitute, as a sin bearer, and as our Savior. And then we continue to live to the glory of God walking in righteousness following after the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you a question. If the day that is coming is the day of judgment, if the day that is coming is the day of smiting, smiting the image and smiting all the gentle kingdoms of the world, the day where which we are now, what day is this one? Number one is the day of salvation. The day of salvation. The day of judgment has not come yet. The day of the smiting of the image has not come yet today. This is the day of salvation. If you are not saved, salvation is available tonight. You will be saved in Jesus' name. If you are saved already, I praise God for you. This is your day of opportunity and your day of salvation and your day of redemption that the Lord has given to you already. I pray you hold on to that salvation till the end in Jesus' name. Let's look at Second Corinthians chapter 6 and we look at verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold now is the accepted time. Behold now is the day of salvation. Don't miss your chance. Don't miss your opportunity. You can just turn away from your sin. Repent of all your evil. Don't wait until the time of the smiting of the image when the day of Christ will be the day of judgment. But you come today for the mercy of God. This day of salvation. Isaiah chapter 55. I'm reading verses 5 and 6. 
Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6. Seek ye the Lord when he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. This day of salvation seek the Lord. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. No matter what sins you have committed, this is still the day of grace, the day of mercy, the day of forgiveness, the day of redemption, the day of salvation. Today you can come to the Lord, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you you will be saved. Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now. This is your day. This is your time. Mercy is still flowing. Redemption is still available. Forgiveness is still being given to the people that turn away from their sins. Come. Come now. Come quickly. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be, a, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. I will eat the good of the land. Number one, today is the day of salvation. Number two, today is the day of soul winning. The day of soul winning. We have a work to do. We have something to do. Here is the day when we are told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. People can be saved today. People can know the Lord today. As you will go out and make it a day of soul winning. It tells us in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Don't say the day of harvest, the day of soul winning, the day of evangelism, the day of crusade. That's still future for, for months ahead. No, it's this very time. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white or ready to harvest. The Lord is saying that as uh, in our districts we are planning crusades and evangelism, and you are listening to their announcements, you should not just go your way, you should join hands with our leaders. And then in every district, in every group, in every community, in every major city in our nation, and all the nations of this continent of Africa and beyond, we continue to preach the gospel because this is the day of soul winning. Number one is the day of salvation. Number two is the day of soul winning. We're looking at verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. And that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true. One, one soweth and another reapeth. I send you to reap, whereon ye bestowed no labor, and all the men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went, where did they go? I said where did they go? Everywhere preaching the word. That means then in every zone, in every community, the people of God should take the word. We know a lot. We have learned a lot. We have a lot. We have the gospel. And we have the Holy Ghost. And then as we are making all these uh, crusades in all our districts, you know this is the day of soul winning. For them is the day of salvation. For those who have not been saved, for us who are saved, is the day of soul winning. Arise and take the gospel to them. Look at verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto, the, unto those things which Philip spake herein and seen the miracles which, they, which he did. As we go for those crusades in those districts and groups and regions and states, there will be miracles in Jesus' name. I said there will be miracles in Jesus' name. Philip was not an apostle. Philip was not a general superintendent. Philip was just one of the seven workers' leaders. But he went to Samaria and miracles attended his soul winning activity for our leaders in the districts and the groups and the regions and the states. Miracles will attend their ministries in Jesus' name.
In verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. It will happen again. And many taken with pulses and that were lame were healed and there was great joy in that city. Number one, the day of salvation. Number two is the day of sowing. Number three is the day of service. The day of service. The day in which we are now is the day when we need to serve the Lord. When we need to give all our strength. Everything we've got to the Lord. And don't wait for the day of smiting. That's not your day. Don't wait for the day of suffering. That's not your day. Don't wait for the day of shattering the kingdoms of the world. That's not your day. Your day is is here now and it's a day of salvation it's a day of soul winning and it is a day of service in john chapter 9 john chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 4 i must work and everybody say that with me i must work can you say it with commitment you will do it in Jesus' name. I must want the works of him that sent me while it is day. While it is the day of service and the day of work, do it and work for the Lord. For the night cometh when no man can work. In Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, the day of service. Don't waste time. Don't waste your day. Don't waste your opportunity. Serve the Lord while you may. In Luke chapter 19 verse 13, And he called his ten, his ten servants, And delivered them ten pounds, And said unto them, Occupy till I come. The Lord is coming. Keep occupied in the work of the Lord. And the Lord will bless the work of your hands in Jesus' name. We come to point number three, the dominion of Christ's sovereign kingdom. The dominion of Christ's sovereign kingdom. We're back in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 34, verse 35, verse 44, and verse 45. I'm, I'm starting from Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. Thou sawest till that his stone was cut out. Without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Not just filling up Israel, not just filling up Babylon, not just filling up a literal empire, the whole earth. The interpretation is what you'll find in verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the king of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom of Christ shall never be destroyed. And then it says, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. You, you need to understand that. When, they, when it was over for Nebuchadnezzar, he left the kingdom for Belshazzar. When it was over for Belshazzar, he left it over for Darius. When it was over for him, he left it for Alexander the Great. When it was over for him, he left it then to the Romans. But in the case of Christ, no other kingdom will take over. When Jesus comes, he's there and he's there forever. And it will reign forever and ever in Jesus' name. The kingdom shall not be left to all the people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand for how long? Forever. In verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out, of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass after it will happen. I said it will happen. 
And then it says, the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. It's talking about the dominion of Christ, and it already tells us that that dominion will be forever and ever. In Daniel chapter 4, we're looking at verse 3. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. That's the kingdom of Christ. That is the dominion of Christ. It's forever and ever. Look at verse 34 of that same Daniel chapter 4. Verse 34 And at the end of the day I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him that liveth for how long? forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. By the end of the day after God visited Nebuchadnezzar with judgment, he had no doubt in his mind that the kingdom of God will be forever and ever. In fact, if you look at chapter 7, this chapter 7 makes it very, very clear. Nothing can be clearer than this. Look at this. In uh, chapter 7 of, of Daniel verse 13 verse 13 I saw in the night visions and behold one like the son of man who is that I said who is that one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven didn't Jesus say that over and over? He said, you will, see, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And here Daniel saw it in vision. He said, I saw the Son of Man coming like the, from well, the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. Who is that? That's God, Almighty God. Here is the Son, the only begotten Son of the Father, the Son of Man, the Son of David, and the Son of God, coming unto the Almighty God, the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the people and all nations and all languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. His kingdom will we shall not be destroyed. Praise the Lord, I'm going to be there. I said I'm going to be there. The kingdom that shall never pass. I will look at verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Well, then we learn that the kingdom that is coming, which is the kingdom of Christ, will be forever and ever. In Psalm 72, Psalm 72, we're reading from verse 7. Psalm 72, we're reading from verse 7. In his days shall the, shall the righteous flourish. An abundance of, pe abundance of peace so long as the moon endures. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They shall dwell in the wilderness, uh, they that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him. All his enemies shall leak. What? I will not be an enemy of God. I will not be an enemy of Christ. Because when Christ comes and he comes in dazzling, a dazzling glory, all those enemies will fall down to the ground. He'll smash them and they will leak the dust. But those of us who belong to the Lord, we shall reign forever and ever with him. In verse 11, ye all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, his name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. Verse 19, blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. And the church said, Amen and 
Amen. You see, the psalmist was so, was so happy and just because he was looking at the coming day when the kingdom of God will be established and the joy that he will be there and the joy that you will be there will bring out an amen from your mouth. In uh, Psalm 145, Psalm 145, I'm reading verse 13. Psalm 145, verse 13. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endures throughout all generations. This is telling us that when Christ comes, then the kingdom will be for him, and he will reign forever and ever. In Isaiah chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, we're looking at verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us the son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the kingdom of his government, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon the, his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Revelation I'm looking at chapter 11 verse 15. Revelation chapter 11 you see what we're reading? All these verses they convince us that all the kingdoms of the world are transitory, temporary. But the kingdom of Christ alone will remain forever as history has confirmed the truth of the prophecy. Because what Daniel spoke about, at that time, the kingdom of Babylon, the Babylonian government had not been destroyed. But Daniel said, it's going, it's going, and it went. And then he came to Belshazzar and he said, your kingdom is divided. It's numbered. You are weighed and found wanting. This very night you are going, you are going. And it went. And then he said, the Middle Persian will come and they will go. They came and they went. And he said, the Grecian government will come and go. And it went. And the Roman Empire will come and go. And it's gone. Every, everything he has said, as he looked at the whole image from the head to the chest to the belly to the thigh and to the feet. You see, everything was fulfilled. The only one that remains to be fulfilled now is that stone is that Christ to come and if all the rest have been fulfilled we know the latter part remaining is going to be fulfilled and Christ will set up an everlasting kingdom now about the kingdom and about Christ there are four things I want you to notice number one observe the immutability of Christ's kingdom that means unchanging it's forever there, immutable. Our King and Lord Jesus Christ shall reign forever and ever. He, as he possesses an unchanging priesthood, so he will hold an unchanging royalty. Number two, look at the, observe the invincibility of Christ, the King. That means his kingdom shall never be destroyed. His kingdom shall never be replaced. His kingdom shall never be defeated or conquered. All other kingdoms have been conquered, but the kingdom of Jesus Christ will remain forever and ever. Number three, observe the immortality of King Jesus. He lives forever. Death cannot affect our king. Neither can decay affect his kingdom. Number four, observe the imperishability of Christ's kingdom. That means his kingdom will never perish. Things that can be shaken, that cannot be shaken, will remain. It is heaven's decree that Christ's kingdom shall stand forever and ever. That kingdom will stand. I said that kingdom will stand. When Jesus Christ takes over and then he begins to rule, what will be the announcement in earth and in heaven, in the whole universe? We're looking at Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, we're looking at verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there, and, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign, tell me how long, forever and ever. That's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Before I close, I have some questions for you.
If Christ is King, if Christ is Lord, and if Christ is reigning now in the hearts of the people that receive him, and if he's coming to establish an everlasting kingdom, where do you stand? What do you do? What's your responsibility? What are you supposed to do today? Just three things before we close. Number one, you're supposed to surrender unto him. Number one is to surrender. Number two, you're supposed to submit to his lordship and to his royalty and to his dominion and to his kingship. Number two is to submit. Number three, you are to serve. You are to serve the Lord as king. You surrender, you submit. You serve. We're looking at Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 15. Second Samuel chapter 15. And we're looking at verse 15. This ought to be your attitude. If you say Jesus is your Savior, Jesus is your Redeemer, and Jesus is your Lord and King, and you say, yes, reign, Master Jesus, reign, Master Jesus, over my heart, my life, my family, everything that I possess, reign without any rival. This ought to be your attitude. Second Samuel chapter 15. 15 verse 15 and the king's servant said unto the king behold thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint if you accept jesus as lord and king that should be your language every day of your life every moment of your life that thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint second king first kings chapter 20 First Kings chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 4. If you are not saying this to Christ, then it's not lip service. It's not reigning your life. It's not having dominion, control, direction of your life. If you want to hold on to your will, then you are just like, you know, those other kings that were spoken about. The head of gold and the chest of silver and the belly of brass and the ties and then the legs of iron. And then the stone is going to come as smash and scatter everything. It's only the people that give themselves to the Lord, that they surrender to the Lord. Those are the people who are going to escape the suffering of that final day. In First Kings chapter 20 verse 4, 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 4, and the king of Israel answered and said, My Lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. If he is your Lord, if Jesus is your king, if Jesus Jesus rules and reigns over you. Then you should be able to tell the Lord, I am thine and all that I have. Number one is to surrender. Number two is to submit. Number two, to submit. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Second Chronicles chapter 29. I'm reading from verse 24. Second Chronicles chapter 29. We're looking at chapter 29 and um, verse 24 is first chronicles. First, 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 first chronicles. In first chronicles chapter 29, verse 24, all the princes and the mighty men and all the sons likewise of King David submitted themselves unto Solomon the king. When Solomon became the king, they didn't look at the fact that they were, they had seen him before, that he was just one of them, that was a little child, that he himself confessed, oh Lord, I'm a little child, I don't know how to go out, how to come in, but he had become king, and we're told all the princes, not, no exception. All the mighty men, no exception. All the sons likewise of King David. Even the sons of King David, they submitted themselves unto Solomon the king. In verse 25, and the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly in the sight of all Israel and bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been any king before him in Israel. Why am I reading that to you? I'm reading that because of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're looking at verse 42. Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. When Solomon became king, 
all the princes, all the sons of King David, and everybody in the land submitted unto King Solomon. And Jesus said, Behold, a greater than Solomon is here, and Jesus is king. Is he king? Then, as they submitted unto Solomon, he is a greater king than Solomon. His kingdom will continue forever and ever. That's the reason why as they submitted to Solomon, then we submit unto him. Number one is to surrender. Number two is to submit. Number three is what? Is to serve. Is to serve. We want to serve the Lord. You are going to serve the Lord. In Psalm 2, we're looking at Psalm 2 verse 10. Psalm 2, we're looking at verse 10. Serve the Lord of fear and rejoice or trembling. That is verse, that's verse 11. Serve the Lord of fear and rejoice with trembling. In verse 12, kiss the son. Come into fellowship with the son. Come into submission of the son. Lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but for a little. For a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. We're looking at John. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse 24. Serve him. Number one. You surrender. Number two, you submit. Number three, now you serve. In John chapter 12, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. We must die to sell. Self-will must die to that. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This your life by the grace of God will bear fruit. You'll bear fruit unto life eternal. And great will be your reward in heaven in Jesus' name. He that loveth his life shall, shall lose it. But, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life ever, unto life eternal. Look at verse 26. If any man serve me, who is that man? I said, who is that person? You are the person you have served the Lord. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. I want to tell the Lord today that we believe in him. We trust him. We accept him. We own him as our savior, as our Lord, as our king. And we surrender. We submit. We're going to serve him. And our service will bring many other people into the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord wants us to realize that he is king. He is Lord. And he wants us to have the right attitude to him as Lord. Lord and as King. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I come to you. Lord, I come to you. Lord, I come to you. I've heard you are going to reign. You are going to rule. And because of that, I submit myself to your authority and to your royalty. The royal authority and power. This is a day of salvation. If you have not been saved, you can call upon the Lord today. And the Lord will save you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from your evil. Whatever conviction the Holy Ghost is bringing in your heart, you want to tell the Lord, oh Lord, here I am. I want to surrender my heart, my life, my will, all that I am. I want to surrender everything to you. He loves you. Come unto me, he said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The restlessness in your soul. He wants to take that away. The worry, the anxiety in your life. He wants to take that away. The pressure, the affliction in your soul. He wants to take that away. He is the king. The king of kings and the lord of lords. And is going to have an everlasting dominion. An everlasting kingdom. If you are wise, you will not waste time. You run to the Lord. You submit to the Lord. You say, Lord, I give my heart, my will, everything I have. I give everything to you. This is the day of my salvation. This is the day of my salvation. Tell the Lord that you come to him. 
you will not hold back anymore. You will not resist him anymore. You will not reject him anymore. In your heart, you are kneeling before the Lord. In your heart, you are bent before the Lord. In your heart, you are submissive before the Lord. And you are saying, Lord, I know you are my Savior. I know you came to save me. I know you died for me on the cross of Calvary so that all my sins can be taken away. I come to you, Lord. I repent. I return to you. I come away from the wilderness of sin. From the evils in my hand, I come unto you. I'm saying, Lord, here am I. Take me, Lord, and cleanse me and wash me and purge me and forgive me all my past sins. The Lord will do it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in unto him and sup with him. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to rule and reign in your heart. Give him a chance. Open the door. Give him, give him yourself. Confess everything wrong that you've done. And then accept him into your heart. And say, Lord, I come. Lord, I come. I receive you today as my Savior, as my Lord. Reign over me. Rule over me. Direct me and control me and lead me all the rest of my life. He will do it. Today is the day of salvation. The future day will be a day of judgment. The future day will be the day of smiting. The future day will be the day of worldwide suffering. Indescribable suffering. Untold suffering. Unimaginable suffering. But the mercy of God is still available today. The grace of God is still available today. The mercy of God and the forgiveness of God. The salvation of the Lord is still available today. That's why the Lord is calling you. And the Lord is saying, come, come now. Don't waste time. Come now. Don't wait until tomorrow. Come now. Come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, I wash them whiter than snow. Though they be like crimson, I'll make them as white as wool. And then he says that if you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Why don't you come to the Lord today? Why don't you come right now? Why don't you say, Lord, I come to reconcile with the Almighty God. Thank you. Jesus, you died for me on the cross of Calvary. I belong to you from now on. No more darkness, no more sin, no more evil, no more all those bad things anymore. I give myself to Christ. Christ. Do it right now. Do it right now. And the Lord will receive you. He will receive you. Then you will not perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That life is coming to you right now. As you just say, Lord, I'm saved. Lord, I come out of my sin. Lord, I come out of my evil. Lord, I come out of everything that is wrong. I come to you. Save me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Receive me, Lord. Receive me into your kingdom. You will do it. You will do it. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. 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 You are not too bad. Don't let the devil tell you you've gone too far. You can say, come to the Lord. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let him reign in your heart right now. Let him rule over your spirit, over your soul, over your very life right now. And say, Lord, here I am. I present myself unto you. Rule and reign over me. There's a day of salvation. There's a day of salvation. And we who are children of God, isn't it the day of soul winning? Isn't it the day to go out and tell other people what the Lord has done for you? If Jesus is your king, you must obey him. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Don't leave the evangelism, the soul winning the crusades, only to the leaders. 
is for the whole church to take the whole world and take it to the whole world. Go and preach the gospel. Go and preach the word of the Lord. Do it in season and out of season. I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Go and tell them. Go and tell them. Our neighbors, co workers, co tenants, relatives, husband, wife, children, parents, tell them that Jesus is mighty to save. This is the day of soul winning. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Or preaching the word of salvation. Or preaching the word of eternal life. Or preaching the word of the mercy of God. The Lord has given us the word of reconciliation. And we have the ministry. The ministry of reconciliation. Go and tell people around you. Don't let them wait until that final day. When there will be no mercy. Don't let them wait for the smashing of the kingdoms of the world. Don't delay too long until the smite stone will come upon the kingdoms of the world. Don't wait too long until the day of suffering and judgment will come. Show them the mercy of the Lord while the mercy is still available. Tell them to run and come into the kingdom. Commit yourself to the ministry of soul winning. Commit yourself to the ministry of reconciliation. Commit yourself to the ministry of taking the gospel everywhere you go. Doesn't matter where you have one person to talk with, speak to them effectively, patiently, passionately. Until they give their hearts, they give their lives unto the Lord. Have mercy on them, have compassion on them, compel them to come in, into the kingdom. Show them the way. Don't let anybody who know you perish in their sins. Tell them. You will forgive if they would only believe. He received them. He rejects none. He rejects none. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Assure them. Assure them. The spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that hear us say, Come. And he who is willing, whosoever, let him take of the water of life freely. Invite them to come. Day of salvation, day of soul winning is a day of service. Are you serving the Lord? Are you only serving the world? Serving yourself? Why don't you take time to serve the Lord? The service of the Lord is profitable. The service of the Lord is rewardable. Be steadfast, unmovable in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your service, your ministry will be abundantly rewarded. Don't be tired in the work the Lord has given you to do in His kingdom. Don't be weary. Serve him. Serve the Lord. Give yourself unreservedly to the service of the King of Kings, to the service of the Lord of Lords. As sure as the Word of God is, Christ will reign. Yes, He's coming to reign. And his kingdom will be that which shall not be destroyed. 
that which will not be left to others. His kingdom will be that which will not pass away. If you want to have a part in that kingdom, serve him now. Surrender to him now. Don't have any part of your life you're holding back from the Lord. Any part of your life you're keeping back from the Lord. Any part of your life you're keeping secret away from the Lord. Give him everything. Surrender everything. Yield everything completely into the hands of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Surrender. Don't hold back. Let him be your King. Let him be your Lord. And let him reign and rule over you. Don't allow any rival in your heart. In your life, let him be the all in all, the only king and the only lord who rules over you without a rival. And let him rule continuously without interruption, morning, noon, and night, every day throughout the rest of your life. In times of temptation, remember the Lord, don't yield to the devil. In times of trial, difficulties, in times of pressure, in times of pain, remember there's a God in heaven. He answers prayer. He'll take care of you. He'll watch over you. Once you submit yourself unto him, he'll protect you to the very end. And as those people surrender to the royal authority of Solomon, you surrender to you and submit to the royal authority of Christ, the Lord Christ, the King. Serve Him. Surrender, submit, and serve. Christ is coming again, as sure as He came the first time. And when He comes, He will rule. And He's inviting you to come. Join him so you can reign and rule with Christ the King.